Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Rollbar. How important is it for you to catch errors before your users do? What if you could resolve those errors in minutes and then deploy with confidence? That's exactly what Rollbar enables for software teams. One of the most frustrating things we all deal with is errors. Most teams either A, rely on their users to report errors, or B, use log files and lists of errors to debug problems. That's such a waste of time. Instantly know what's broken and why with Rollbar. Reduce time wasted debugging and automatically capture errors alongside rich diagnostic data to help you defeat impactful errors. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow. It integrates with your source code repository and deployment system to give you deep insights into exactly what changes caused each error. Give Rollbar a try today at no cost to you. No credit card is required. Our listeners get access to the Bootstrap plan with 100,000 events for free for 90 days. To get started, head to rollbar.com slash changelock. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. G'day, you're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of everything JavaScript. I'm Sue Sinton, I'm your host for this episode, and I'm joined by some fantastic panelists, as always. First up, we have K-Ball. Hello, K-Ball. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good, good. And we are welcoming back Safio. So, so excited to have you as well as one of our panelists. Hey, everybody. Great to be back. So today we're going to be talking about accessibility and how that fits into JavaScript and the web. But first of all, not everybody knows exactly what accessibility is, so we wanted to cover an intro on the topic. So when we talk about accessibility, uh, in a very broad general sense, we're talking about access for everybody of different abilities. And so in the real world, we can think about things such as ramps for wheelchair access, elevators, um, and things like closed captioning on um, TV shows and movies. However, you know, we, we think about much more specific um, domain areas for accessibility when it comes to the web. So Cable, what kind of things have you run into when working with um, the web and accessibility? And what have you sort of had to learn about when putting websites together? Good question. So I think one of the first things for me to think about accessibility or for me to learn about accessibility was that this is not just about disability. This is about enabling all of the different ways that people interact with the web. And one of the biggest things for me on that has been keyboard navigation. I'm kind of an old school developer. I do a lot of stuff in the terminal. I do all sorts of keyboard navigation there. Uh, And if I go to a website and I can't keyboard navigate it, that gets really frustrating. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I know some folks who use only their keyboard and particularly, you know, if you're using some sort of uh, screen reader technology, you may be using almost entirely a keyboard type of approach, but even just using it simply, a lot of times things don't work as they're, you would expect, you know, you kind of expect to be able to tab through a website, uh, navigate menus and drop downs and things like that using your keyboard. Those are technically accessibility features and functionality, but, uh, it's easy to get them wrong, especially as you're adapting you know, more high-end JavaScript, going away from native uh, components and using custom components. Uh, many of those custom components don't come with built-in keyboard nav. They just don't work. It's very true. And I feel that knowing the built-in accessibility of just general um, HTML elements is really important to have as a background before you even start designing new custom components in the first place. Would you agree with that? Definitely. And it's definitely something that I've, you know, I'm guilty of falling down on when I set up my own components as well is I don't always think about that up front. I'm thinking about, okay, how am I going to get this thing to lay out and function? And I'm, you know, practice interacting with it with my uh, mouse as I'm going. And then at some point, I try to just tab through it 
that like I would if it were a native element and it doesn't work. And I'm like, oh man, like I should have been thinking about that from the start. It's so true. And sometimes it's a really bad feeling when you turn the screen reader on and you're navigating with all the different pieces of that component and you just hear silence or you hear it announce something that is completely wrong as well. Absolutely. You know, and I, I'm far from an accessibility expert. Um, one of the things that I, I loved uh, when I first gotten started with or got started with Zurb Foundation was that they had built in accessibility to all their native components. Now, that isn't necessarily there in the React port or the View port or whatever of it. It was just, you know, when they were doing, uh, you know, basic JavaScript jQuery enabled uh, stuff. But it let me not have to think about it. And I'd love to see us get to a place where, you know, this is something that all of these different component libraries that, you know, most people are using are judged on their accessibility because your average developer doesn't want to have to worry about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I feel that if you have things that are accessible out of the box, that has a multiplier effect where people are just sort of accidentally, you know, creating accessible interfaces based on those building blocks as well. So Cabal just mentioned, you know, he wishes we could get to a point where accessibility features were considered part of deciding whether or not you wanted to use a particular web component. Um, So I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on what do you think is like the cultural change that needs to happen or what can open source communities or the JavaScript community do to start making accessibility the kind of thing that you would check when you're starting to use a tool the same way we check security or readability of the code or how good their API is? Like, what do you think we can do to make that a factor? I think that it's definitely getting better because we're having much more open conversations about it, um, given that things like Twitter and other social media outlets, we're seeing advocates speak up more often. For me, I've always felt that there was this missing cool or trendy factor to do with accessibility, which is sad that it feels like it needs to become trendy for people to care about it. But usually what I think will work for us to get better at this is to tie it back to craftsmanship. A lot of developers and just about every developer, I feel, wants to always create super high quality work. And by tying it back to that craftsmanship of creating something that is super high quality in things like performance, code quality, um, you know, the how fast you can ship it and maintain it, um, I feel that tying that back to accessibility as in one of those sort of factors of craftsmanship is something that I'm hoping we see people um, start to consider. Interesting you'd say that because I honestly think it's the other, it's going to come from economics, right? Because I think, you know, we all want to be craftspeople when we have the time to do it, but very few developers actually have the time to, to sort of create their perfect system and do that. A lot of times we're trying to get something done quickly because we're on a deadline. And if we think about like, when did mobile first and having a mobile accessible website uh, start to really take off? It was when there was enough demand from mobile phones and things, people like Google started prioritizing results that were mobile friendly and all these sort of economic factors Push and now almost nobody's thinking, at least in the States, is thinking about how do I build a website that's not mobile first? I think accessibility is going to be the same, driven by the same thing and probably by not so much by disability, but by uh, a change in the ways we're interacting with websites. Um, I would, was at a keynote at FluentConf uh, a month or so ago where Scott Davis talked about accessibility. And one of the things he highlighted was that. You know, as we move more towards devices that are voice activated, accessibility features become much more key. Because if we think about what does accessibility really mean, it means interactions with the website or with the web application by a computer trying to parse this code without a visual cue in quite the same way. We have Alexa, we have Google Voice, we have all these th- or things that are starting to, or not Google Voice, Google Home these things that are starting to be entirely machine driven where our entire interaction with them is by voice. And that's going to start pushing the economics to, to make this a priority, I think. 
I think that's a good point. And I, I like that you mentioned the mobile kind of um, push to actually start supporting mobile access to websites. I think what's interesting about that particular scenario is that you actually have the data to back up how many people are you know using websites via their mobile phones? I think the snag that we have in accessibility is that you know because of privacy, because people don't always want to volunteer, um, you know that they have different accessibility needs. It's much much harder for us to have hard data on you know specific users on specific websites and you know how they're actually navigating around your site. And so what what concerns me is that this is moving so slowly compared to something like, you know, um, mobile use, because we just don't have the things to prove that it would be an ec- an economical advantage to provide for these people, I guess. That's a really interesting point. So does it, what does it look like if Alexa reads your website to someone? Do, that, do you get anything like that? I guess that probably looks like an Amazon crawler at some point, but then they probably cash it. I don't, that's. Right. And Let's say if you're deaf, um, you're not. You're probably not going to buy an Alexa unless it can provide some form of communication in a visual style, right? So there are some of the Alexa devices that have like a um, like a screen, and so they might get that, but they're not necessarily speaking to it, especially if that's just not their preferred form of communication. So yes, you know there are visual forms of Alexa, but it's not necessarily optimized for those people. So if they're not buying the device in the first place, then you you aren't aware of the money that you're potentially losing by them not actually buying it in the first place, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of invisible sort of opt out moments for people of different abilities that is really, really hard to measure, I guess. I wonder if you could do, so one of the things that really got people started focusing on performance and front end performance um, was these sort of e-commerce studies that came out that looked at, you know, how many dollars are lost or how many people abandon your website based on different speeds. I wonder if there's a metric that could be measured there that would, you know, let folks sort of once again quantify this and say, okay, you know, we tested with differing levels of accessibility, same way we might test with different levels of speed. Uh, and here's how much money you're losing. Here's how many customers are going away. Yeah. I wonder if when you're assessing with a technique like that, when you're trying to say, you know, this is how much money we lost because our website was slow or website was inaccessible. If you're already kind of targeting for the demographic that's already on your website and you're trying to build accessibility features towards an audience that doesn't necessarily need them, which I think sometimes is an issue that springs up where people bring a accessibility, not as things that you need on your website for people with disabilities or for people who need them, but um, as things you can add for individuals who, you know, might not really identify as having a disability or need them necessarily, but that, but those particular classes of accessibility improvements target them. So I hope I'm making sense, but I think sometimes there's like the things you do that are accessibility features, quote unquote, but they're still targeted towards a pretty um, general audience. And then there's the specific features that you need to work on for individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, hard of sight, so on. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I really liked about the Scott Davis keynote I mentioned is he he kind of brought that up explicitly. He, he had a thing that he said, he said, if we tie disability to accessibility, it opens the doors to all kinds of excuses. Like you kind of say, oh, of course I want my website to be accessible, but we don't have the time or the funding. And do we really need it? It's just this small, you know, set of people. Um, but he was kind of, and that's that's one of the reasons I go to things like Alexa or or that sort of thing. But he even highlighted like pinch and zoom on a phone is technically an accessibility feature. And many, many people, I mean, he did a poll of the audience and like how many people have pinched or zoomed on their iPhone or Android? And there's like 80% of the audience right? That's accessibility though. That's, that's the functional set that we're talking about accessibility is maybe, I think we've, we've probably suffered by framing it too much about disability and, uh, you know, assistive devices and need to think about it more as like, how do we make this more, it's almost like multi-device friendly. It's not just responsive in terms of screen size. It's responsive in terms of all the ways you want to interact with this website. 
I definitely agree with that. I feel that the 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 quote that a lot of people say is that accessibility, you know, benefits everybody. And I think that that's true. And that's a really good way of trying to justify um, improving the accessibility of the website that you're working on. You can say, well, you know, the experience actually gets that much better for absolutely everyone um, because some of the changes that you make are, th- are things concerning color contrast, which even for somebody who has good vision, um, you know, color contrast will always benefit everybody um, no matter what. And if you have something like closed captioning, Um, That can be really useful if you're in a quiet room and you don't have headphones and you don't want to disturb anybody or if your uh, child is sleeping or something like that. And so I just feel like all of these things that feel like they're pointed at a super small audience, um, as you both just said, actually expands to benefit much more people who wouldn't necessarily identify with having special needs. Yeah. Oh, the captioning is a really interesting one. Um... I saw something float by recently. I'm just Googling to see if I can find it. I found a different stat, but you know, video watched on social media. Most people were watching this on a mobile device without sound. And there is a stat that um, I found one Digiday published a, a couple years ago, but I don't, I wouldn't imagine it's changed that much. Um, they're saying 85% of video views on Facebook are happening without sound. So if you're not applying closed captioning, which is essentially, or making your video itself contain enough text to be understandable without sound, that's technically accessibility potentially, but you're throwing away 85% of your audience. Totally. And I feel that even though it was auto playing video, that sort of, you know, which most of us love to hate, um, auto play video did do a lot of good in that regard in, in pushing that for sure. I think it's a really, really good stat to know about. Yeah, I think that was when I learned that factoid, I thought it was really interesting too. the fact that, you know, Facebook made this probably economic decision like we were going back to um, to have autoplaying videos in their newsfeed. And the consequence ended up being that if you wanted to get people's attention, you had to have, you know, a flashy video with lots of interesting text. And kind of the side effect of that ended up being that you actually produced videos that were quite accessible and approachable to a lot of people. So it's kind of cool to see how that one decision intersected and had a lot of different side effects. So that's pushed video in the right direction, though I, there's still a lot of video out there without closed captioning. Are there other things that we can think of that might push you know pieces of this forward, right? There's, there's the Alexa question, but quantification is hard. I, I think Suze is spot on with that. Is there a way that, to potentially, you know, kind of connect those dots and say like, here's what, what you need to do to make your website Alexa friendly or Google home friendly and what that's going to actually do for you. I think that a lot of that information is out there. I think that people feel super overwhelmed because accessibility is such a broad topic as well. And so, you know, it's, it's very much like performance. Performance is split into lots of different areas of, of how you can affect performance and what the different types are. I think the same happens with accessibility where you say, well, okay, it's not just about keyboard navigation. You know, we, we wrote a list when we were discussing uh, this show. We have things like keyboard navigation, screen reader annotation, color contrast, um, vestibular and motion difficulties, closed captioning, um, even things like timed tasks, because if you're navigating through a website more slowly, um, or you, if you have um, some cognitive dysfunctions, then you're going to not be able to respond in time when there are things like buying tickets um, and there's you know a countdown of you have two minutes to fill out this form. I just feel like there's you know, and there, there are many, many more. Um, things under the accessibility umbrella. And I think that when people first dabble into the topic, they get super overwhelmed because they don't know what to focus on first. They're not aware of how long these things are going to take, you know, to incorporate into their design practices. And they also just don't know where to start, I think. Definitely resonate with that. Sometimes I'm looking at it, I'm like, where do I even start with this? Uh, I always personally go back to keyboard navigation just because it's something that I use. Uh, whereas the other ones I don't necessarily use as much, but it's also, it's hard and there's inconsistencies across browsers and it's, how do I build this? How do I do this? It's a whole new skill set. Mm-hmm. 
So I have some pretty awesome news to share. We are now partnered with Algolia. If you've ever searched Hacker News, Teespring, Medium, Twitch, or even Product Hunt, then you've experienced the results of Algolia's search API. And as we expand our content, we knew that one day we'd have to either roll our own search solution on top of Postgres, or we could partner up with Algolia. And I'm happy to report that phase one of our search is now powered by Algolia. We're able to fine tune our indexing, gain insights from search patterns and analytics. We can create custom query rules to influence ranking behavior as well as improve our search experience by adding synonyms and alternative correction to queries. Sure, we could build search ourselves, but that would mean we would be busy doing that instead of shipping shows like you're listening to right now. Huge thanks to our friends at Algolia for working with us. Check the show notes for a link to get started for free or learn more by heading to Algolia.com. So in the previous segment, we touched a little bit about why you should care about accessibility. You know, we talked about the fact that it's it's really important that everyone's able to access um, your website. It's a really good thing to do. Um, and we talked about the economical side of it as well. But there are a couple of other reasons that we haven't really talked about. Um, and one of them is a little bit scary, which is the legal consequences of not providing accessibility. So have um, have either of you run into that before where you've worked at a company and you've you've had some kind of legal action taken against you because something wasn't accessible to somebody? I have not had that experience or heard of anyone having it, but it's very intriguing. I'd love to know, you know, what happened and how it went. I have not either, but I do know that the the sort of legal structure there was one of the big motivators behind integrating accessibility into the Zurb Foundation framework so much because we had a bunch of users who were governmental uh, and companies you can sort of play dice with that where you can say oh are they going to ding us are they not going to ding us like are we going to get hit for this whatever but if you're working for a local or state or federal government you kind of have to obey the laws and so we had a lot of folks who were really pushing for we need to make this bake in accessibility from the ground up because we're using this to build government websites and they have to full stop be accessible I know that that's also expanded outside of government as well. I'm pretty sure that airlines um, ended up being legally compelled to make their websites accessible a number of years ago. And I think that that might have been because of a collective legal action. But I know that they're definitely much more on top of things these days. And so are banks as well. So I'm curious to know when you say that airlines and banks are required to be a little bit more on top of their websites being more accessible. Are you talking about, you know, they were sued and um, as a result of that lawsuit, they then had to go and enact changes in their process? Or is it that there are certain governmental regulations that affected them? Um, Was it industry regulations? Like what was the kind of legal case for them making that a part of their web design approach? So I actually cannot remember this. I actually need to look it up. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can actually just break for a second so that I can answer that question. Well, I'll just talk on for a while while you look it up and fill space, right? <laughs> um, so just at a high level, airlines are heavily, heavily regulated. Um, we've got all sorts of stuff in place really because of the safety requirements, I think, originally, right? You know, air air travel did not used to be nearly as safe as it is now. And it then was heavily regulated in order to improve its safety. But once that foot is in the door, then it starts getting regulated on all sorts of fronts. And uh, I suspect that's one of the reasons why they're kind of canary in the coal mine for getting this enforced early. I don't know if there was a specific thing. I think, yeah, Susie, you're looking for that. but. You know, they have heavy disability, you know, and accessibility like physical requirements already, um, and they've got you know all sorts of things around safety and recording and all the all the stuff that they're already having to comply with. And so, adding web accessibility on top of that, it's not like they're not already familiar with uh, working with that. Um, in the chat, it looks like uh, Esk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your your moniker correctly, but she says she works for a company that was sued. And now as a result, they take accessibility very seriously. Uh, I'm curious, what was the 
what is the domain for that company? Like what is the um, area of business? Yeah, because it depends on what area you work in, right? And Cable, you're right on the money about the the airlines. It's all part of the Air Carrier Access Act, which was already issued by the U.S. Department of Transportation to require, um, you know, that people can actually use their services like physically. Um, and so they ended up extending those rules within that Air Carrier Access Act to cover um, the websites that people are booking tickets on and, and changing their plans. And so they ended up setting up three key requirements um, of the non-discrimination on the basis of disability in air travel, which is cool, which also expanded to the automated kiosks at the actual airports as well. So this was... Um, this was imposed as a deadline for November 2015. So it's actually only in the last three years that they've had to conform to certain online web accessibility standards such as um, WCAD 2.0, which is super interesting. But yeah, I'm interested in hearing the story in chat about what area that um, they were sort of dealing with this in. She said uh, hospitality. So that That's kind of interesting. So that's probably like hotels or you know, some sort of travel situation. It's funny because I think right now we're doing this very one-off. And if we look at the the domains of physical space um, and regulating, you know, physical building access and things like that, that is kind of over time become more and more regulated. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the uh, boundaries are now, but it, it probably started with it just being governments. And now essentially any large company has to have some amount of physical access for disability in various forms um, if they're providing public service, right? I, actually, I shouldn't say that off the top of my head because I don't know. But what is the what is the physical accessibility requirements? Because we may see a mirror of that coming to the web. The web has long been less regulated, uh, but I have suspicion, particularly in reaction to all the stuff with the elections the last few years, that regulate more regulation is on the horizon. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that because the Americans with Disabilities Act, which kind of required a lot of the accessibility features that you see out in the real world, um, was, I think, effective in 1990. So it kind of predated the internet and it would be interesting to see, you know, if something like that were to come in 2018, would there be a clause or a segment of it that was specifically targeted at accessibility of uh, software products, um, considering that, you know, that probably wasn't as big a thing in 1990 as it is now. I would be so excited to see that happen. I, I'm someone who is all in on accessibility and I think that even just having a blanket set of standards that we're all kind of responsible for. And instead of them just being a list of guidelines would be amazing. Think about how that would change the way that we teach um, computer science subjects. You know, when you learn front end development, it's going to be baked in from the beginning because, you know, you don't want to lose your company a lot of money. Um, and so part of being a, a good engineer is providing you know, accessible work that you're outputting. And I would love to see that that legal side of things or just the regulation, just because I think that really is the push that we need to do it uh, on top of the economical stuff that we talked about earlier as well. What do you think, Cable? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is interesting to think about the, way, the different ways that something like this can happen, right? You can have a pull from economics or you can have a push from regulation. And in the tech industry, we have historically resisted the regulation side of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of Wild West, and that has, as a result, perhaps underprioritized some of these uh, things that are, are definitely social goods, you know, like basically accessibility to all. I, I would just, just Googling right now to figure out what the, uh, range of things that the ADA applies to um, and for physical spaces. And it, at this point, is essentially anything that's public accommodations. It says businesses that are generally open to the public and fall into one of the service categories of restaurants, movie theaters, schools, daycare facilities, recreation facilities, doctor's offices. There's 12 um, areas. And 
then requires newly constructed or altered places um, to comply with the standards. So they're basically saying if you're in any of these businesses that are used by the public, you have to comply. And maybe you didn't have to you know, comply with a legacy thing, but as soon as you update your, your building, you need to be in compliance. So if we start seeing more regulation on the internet, we could see something that's, that's similar, right? We already have it for airlines, but we could ha- say, okay, you know, if you are selling food online, you know, you're, you're doing restaurant ordering or, or uh, you know, takeout or something like that, you have to be accessible. If you are you're providing banking, you have to be accessible. If you, you know, are, I don't know what, what other verticals would make sense, but definitely could see that sort of push factor happening. And I don't think at this point, like does any, nobody really pushes back that much on the public spaces. It's more accepted. It's just the, the virtual ones where we're like, oh, is that really necessary? Do we have to, you know? Yeah. I like the idea of just removing the need to have that conversation where you're not sure if it's necessary. I really like having those concrete sort of like strategy for, okay, well, I'm in this sector and therefore I just need to do this. And so it makes it so much easier, even when you're having those discussions in meeting rooms about deadlines and things, it's just like, it doesn't become an opportunity for something to drop by the wayside, which, which in, at least in my anecdotal experience, I've seen that become the the thing that's first dropped from a sprint uh, when releasing a feature or the uh, minimum viable product that's going out is usually not accessible. Um, And having to negotiate the time to go back in and fix it, which is usually more time than just baking it in the first place, um, is really frustrating. And I just love to see those sort of um, those those conversations disappear so that everybody's just on the same page. That'd be great. Yeah. And I think uh, another thing with respect to the kind of, is it a pull via economics or a push via regulations is that sometimes the things that you can quantify as like financially beneficial or economically beneficial aren't necessarily directly related to accessibility, like improving accessibility in your product has a lot of intangible benefits that you can't actually tie to an economic end goal, but those intangible benefits to the people that are affected by them and those who are not still matter. And I think that's kind of, we're having that like clear and concise language around what the basic standards are and what everyone within a specific kind of industry um, is going to help for kind of touching on those intangible benefits of accessibility. Absolutely. I look forward to the day when we have a scenario where just like you would never design a button that you can't physically click on, right? Like everybody knows that without even thinking, you know, no no developer would ever make a button that you can't click on. I'm looking forward to all of those other sort of standards um, and common sense parts of accessibility to just become exactly as, you know, fast as that. You just don't even have to think about whether or not you should be doing these things. I think we're moving in the right direction. You know, one of the biggest things for uh, making that possible. So first, there's visibility into the problem, and as you mentioned, Suze, I think um, you know this is getting more and more talked about. This is something where awareness of this as a challenge is growing and growing as something that we should should be doing, but we haven't bridged the barrier between should and it's the default. Um, the next step on there is improving the ease effect you know how how do we make it so that not only is this something we should be doing but really it's not that hard you know we can just do it it's not it doesn't feel like this massive undertaking and i think you know there it's it's a lot about tooling um i think there's you know i talked a little bit about wanting component libraries to take this on but there's even just at the the browser level there's a lot of different tools that could make a difference. I was really excited a few weeks ago to see the Firefox shipped with a new accessibility inspector, which basically lets you use the same type of dev tools that you would use to inspect your DOM tree to ex- inspect what they're calling the, I think the accessibility tree is what they called it, where you're, you're able to kind of see what is the underlying structure that they are building to get, hand off to a screen reader or whatever sort form of assistive technologies. And once it becomes 
this is something that is easy to understand and look at and see how it's working rather than this is this black magic that I I'm supposed to understand, but I have to, you know, when I asked how to do it, somebody pointed me to a 300 page book or, or something like that. <laughs> like that's, what's going to make it more prevalent. I definitely agree with that. And I know that the accessibility tree has only really been viewable on an operating system level before this. So bringing it straight into the browser just takes a lot of the intimidation out of it because if it's in there um, with all of your other dev tools, then it's also sort of nudging at you that, yes, you probably should also be using this and we're going to design it in a way that makes sense for um, the context of making uh, web content as well. That's a really, really good point. I'm really happy to see that these tools are starting to come in on not just like an individual, you know, software library perspective, but also, you know, browser vendors. And um, we also have Lighthouse within Chrome, which allows you to at least um, have have um, some kind of testing in order to surface some of the, I guess, the things that you can find with static analysis and things like that. Because usually if you can help developers automate this stuff, um, and like you said, make it understandable as well, then that's already a major step forward for being able to help developers improve at this practice. Yeah. Fundamentally, we're lazy, right? And that's, that's, <laughs> I hear that a lot about developers. Developers are lazy. I mean, that's just humans. People are lazy. That's, that's how we are. And so if we want something to happen, we need to make it easy. If we want it to happen at a broad scale. That's right. You're already juggling a lot of different things in your head as you're producing something like this is another thing to juggle. And so the putting as much of this stuff to the background as possible, um, yeah, through the use of good tools and um, best practices is really, really helpful to everybody. I think just for those whose brains are just so full of all of the different things that we have to keep in mind. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Smith, senior producer here at Changelog. You know how important it is to stay in the know. And our weekly newsletter helps you and thousands of other developers do exactly that. It's the developer news that matters, nothing more and nothing less. Visit changelog.com and subscribe today. So let's continue talking about tools and what people can use in order to help with providing more accessible websites. So we talked about the Firefox Accessibility Inspector. We, we touched on Light, Light, Lighthouse really quickly. What are some other tools that developers can make use of just to make their life a little easier when producing accessible content? I am a huge fan of the Axe. Uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, Chrome DevTools extension. It's an accessibility checker for um, Chrome DevTools. And I really like it just because of, no pun intended, but the accessibility of the tool. It kind of sits right there on your DevTools and I'm forced to look at it whenever I'm trying to inspect an element or jump into the JavaScript console really quickly. And I think the fact that it's right there and it's a little bit in your face makes it really easy to integrate into part of my workflow. Um, and for those who have not heard of it before, what it does is it basically does a analysis of the website in its current state, and it'll recommend things for you to fix. It might say something like, you know, this image tag at this location does not have a descriptor, so be sure to add that. Or the contrast on these colors isn't good, so, you know, adjust your font color and your background color. Um, that's one of my favorite tools to use. Agreed. I love Axe Core so, so much. And I think what you said about it being just another part of your dev tools is what makes it always top of mind. Like sometimes it can be scary to click on the tab and look at all the warnings come up, but it's, I love the, um, I love the output of those warnings the most because they'll describe something in a human readable format, but then they'll also link straight to the spec that, you know, it's outlined in, whether that's like, um, some of the ARIA um, specifications or the WCAG um, accessibility guidelines as well. I love that tool. Yeah. So in that way, it's a really great way to educate yourself too. So you shouldn't feel like you already have to be an expert in order to start using it. It'll kind of teach you the more you start using it. 
Exactly. Because I don't know about you, but I have tried to read the WCAG guidelines like from start to finish. And it's really, really hard to do in one sitting. And you definitely get overwhelmed very quickly. <laughs> I hadn't used X. So as you were talking, I went and installed it and I'm running it on one of my website I'm doing for a client. And uh, it's highlighting a lot of issues, <laughs> I'm going to say. <laughs> well, it's a good thing you caught them. I know, right? Well, it actually, it raises kind of an interesting question to me. You know, so I work in a context where I'm working with clients. Often I'm not driving design decisions. I'm implementing design decisions. And I'm looking at this page that I'm working on right now and highlights 66 instances of elements must have sufficient color contrast. That's a discussion that I don't know how, I mean, I know how painful the, the color decisions already were. And I've litigated that and relitigated that before. Um, but it kind of raises this question of like, when these things come up, like it's not just a developer problem, right? This is, a, they, this is embedded throughout the design process of thinking about contrast and color palettes and, and all these different pieces. How are you having these conversations throughout sort of your dev processes? Yeah, absolutely. I am lucky enough to work in an organization where, you know, there is a kind of feedback loop between design and development. So development communicates with design, design communicates with development, and it's a two-way street. I know that's definitely not the situation, you know, if you're working in a um, client relationship or something like that. And, you know, your situation got me thinking if there are tools like Axe, for designers, you know, something that'll take your um, sketch file or your PSD or whatever it is that designers use. Sorry, I'm not a designer. Um, and, and do an audit of it um, just so, you know, before it even gets into implementation, it's already being checked. Um, I wonder if anyone in the chat might have recommendations for tools to that effect. Just doing a quick Google on it, I see a color contrast checker. So that's something. Yeah, I've worked with designers who have used the contrast checkers before, but they they have to already be aware that they need to provide that good contrast in the first place. But I think it's a really good first step. And I've been really encouraged by seeing more and more designers over my career start using tools like that so that they don't have that oopsie moment when they present it, you know, to developers who, you know, might already be able to spot that stuff after they've spent hours picking colors, you know. Yeah, and I think that's kind of, you know, the there's the discussion around what tools will help people achieve the development of accessible websites and then what kind of like education and um, communication is going to help them. It's kind of a two-pronged problem. So it's really interesting. You can't just give somebody the tool. You have to also empower them to use it. And I don't know if I have an answer to the latter. I've definitely um, hacked my way into having these discussions with designers before, um, just being on the front end developer side, if there's been an internal hackathon at a company, um, you know, this has come up before where I've created something that you sort of bolt on to improve, um, something such as color contrast. So I'll create a little toggle at the bottom of a page and you can turn on high contrast mode. And that, that just, uh, prefetches and loads a CSS style sheet that overrides a bunch of the colors. And I remember I presented that at the end of the hack week and there were several de designers sort of watching my presentation. Um, and I didn't really think that it had a huge impact on them, but I think about six months later, the, um, the website went through a rebranding where all of the colors were being overhauled. The design was being overhauled everything. And to my delight, um, they actually used a color contrast checker this time because a lot of the colors just weren't um, high contrast enough with the initial branding. And they were very proud to show me we've come up with all of these different combinations that work and we've now put this in our patent library as, you know, which colors we recommend to overlay on, um, you know, other colors, depending on whether it's text or a background color. And I was so excited to see that. And sometimes you just need to give them a nudge because you never know when you're even going to be able to go back and redesign those colors, even if you feel like they're set in stone in the present time. Yeah, there's definitely that. It's a good point. You know, we, we've got to be bringing this foot forward and actually it highlights to me, a lot, something we've talked about before on this uh, podcast about 
the responsibility of developers to bring themselves and their sort of opinions and moral positions into their code. Uh, there's a great quote that says, there no, excuse me, there is no technical decision that is not also a political or moral decision, right? Like the things that we are building have implications that if you're aware of them, for example, in accessibility and you say, hey, you know, this is, this is going to exclude a heck of a lot of people. It's kind of your responsibility to bring it up. Totally agree. So what are some other good tools? Uh, so I, I had never heard about AxeCore and I've now installed it and I'm going to start using it on all my websites. So that's super cool. Um, we talked about the accessibility inspector. For Lighthouse, is it just, does Lighthouse get you anything that AxeCore doesn't or is it just another take on the same thing? It's similar, but because it gives you that overall score for progressive web apps, it's like another sort of uh, box that you can check off. So I think it, it presents it in a slightly more satisfying way, but it has similar static analysis tools, I think. So uh, one tool that I really like, which is similar to AxeCore, but is more integrated with your site is uh, a tool called Totally, which was developed by um, Khan Academy, um, one of the, the engineers who used to work there. And it is a bookmarklet that when you click on it, on whichever website, you know, you currently have open in a tab, it will overlay some messages to show you um, the areas of your site that the color c contrast is not high enough. And I just love that it pinpoints it directly. So you're not sort of like racing around trying to find like which, you know, specific piece of text on which specific piece of background that, you know, a warning is referring to. So I love it because it just gives you that instant visual representation of the problematic areas on your page. And I love that you can just keep clicking it um, as you sort of like uh, navigate to different areas of the site as well. So I've definitely used that just to be able to sort of show people really quickly uh, where the problem areas are on a page. Um, another one of my personal favorites is since I do develop with react on the front end is a tool called, oh, I always have trouble pronouncing it when it's like the abbreviated version, uh, react ally. Is it ally or a 11 Y? I've heard both. Okay. I'm going to go with ally since it sounds easier to say. Um, see so yeah, react ally. It's basically a tool that you can integrate um, into your linter that will warn you or throw an error on certain common accessibility faux pas, like not including a descriptor on a tag or not including tab indexes on elements, things like that. Um, and I really like it because you'll kind of, again, it's integrated into what's already there for you as a developer. So it kind of is going to be built into your like habit or just the way you think about development because you're constantly getting these warnings about, you know, use your alt tags or do this or do that. Um, and it's in that way, similar to the um, Axe tool, it also kind of teaches you and trains you to integrate those patterns more into the way you write code, the more you use it. That is super cool. I know that there's one of those for Ember as well that you can build into Ember's testing framework, which I absolutely love and I, I like the, the idea of being able to break uh, builds and continuous integration, you know, if there is a, you know, pretty big glaring accessibility issue for sure. Yeah, that's actually, that's another way to put this feature forward as you say, okay, this is part of our integration tests. Uh, so you know, if the build is broke, you got to fix it. Cheers to that. <laughs> One resource that I really love, which is not necessarily um, focused on like a technical tool, is there is an accessibility Slack that is full of accessibility experts and accessibility enthusiasts alike. And I've definitely popped in to ask them tricky questions. I think accessibility is the most difficult when you have those scenarios where, oh, I've actually never had to program this sort of behavior before. And I have no idea what would be the best experience for somebody who is using a keyboard, for example, um, for something such as drag and drop, that can be a really difficult thing to get your head around. And my favorite thing about the accessibility Slack is you can pop in and, and pitch these scenarios. And there, there's always going to be someone who's run into something very similar. And there's going to be a bunch of people that know a ton about accessibility and they're very, very friendly in there. So I highly encourage everybody to check out that Slack and just 
just lurk in there because you learn so much just from seeing all of these questions that people pose in there. Yeah. What is the right way to do drag and drop with a keyboard? It's it's complicated. <laughs> it definitely depends on the um, scenario. Um, but there are a few resources out there for um, trying to make it accessible. Um, I have an interface right now where I want to use the arrow keys so that you can basically use a key as a toggle on a certain um, box that you drag around. And then you can basically use arrows to move it back and forth. So that was what I came up with as a solution, but it really does depend on what functionality you're providing as a result of drag and drop. Like if, if it's just dragging and dropping a file onto, you know, a file input, then you can just also provide a button for people to either click or access with a keyboard. Right. So it definitely goes super deep with drag and drop, but it depends on what you're after. Well, that highlights something kind of interesting too, right? Cause what you described. So if I think about a, a drop down menu, that drop down menu is actually going to look the same whether or not I'm using a keyboard or a mouse. Um, you know, I'm just opening it via tab versus, or you know, via a keyboard key versus with a, a hover or a click. Uh, but with drag and drop, you might actually need new interface elements to provide the same functionality. Yep, pretty much. How often, I mean, so it, I think you've probably been struggling with this or working on this a lot more than I have recently. So how often do you find that's the case where to make something accessible, you literally have to introduce new concepts or elements to it. I think it depends. Even something as simple as, um, you know, when you click on a hamburger menu, like there is no sort of, there's no built-in semantic HTML element that makes those easy to navigate, right? And so you tend to cobble them together as, you know, a custom component, such as it'll be a div and there might be a, a bunch of list items in there. And hopefully with actual real anchor tags, real links, and not just somebody clicking on the list item. But you sort of have to start from scratch with a lot of these things that you might take for granted every day as um, as something that you've used a hundred times. I think all of them are nuanced in that way. And so I would say that I run into these kind of scenarios a fair bit, given that single page applications now, um, you know, have a ton of things like modals, which modals take the place of alerts, but they're definitely nowhere near as accessible. And so again, you have to reinvent the wheel, you know, uh, how do we put the same accessibility into a modal that used to exist in an alert um, window that popped up that was, you know, governed by the browser? And so it's a. I think that it's a lot more common than people think. It's just that once you sort of see, once you learn about accessibility, you start seeing those difficulties everywhere. I think that's, it's more of a, a situation like that. So in a lot of ways, this is a complete mind shift of how you're approaching development. Because you, I think you're so. starting from a different place. Yeah, I definitely think that that's true. Um, it's it's this sort of hidden facet that you might not have noticed, and then it's it's another sort of shift in how you approach designing and also writing code. I think for sure. I think what's really illuminating, especially, is watching like humans access your site in ways that you don't personally do so on a daily basis. And I think that all of these automative, um, you know, processes are really, really great with testing and validation, but I think that nothing really replaces sitting down next to somebody, watching them use your website with a screen reader, watching them use your website with just one button, you know, no keyboard, just one button cycling through, um, you know, uh, elements on your page or even just, um, trying to access something um, like a video when they're deaf, just watching somebody do that and feeling that awkwardness and, and just sitting there cringing because they've stumbled upon something that's not working can just be incredibly illuminating. And I think that it should be a necessary part of your cycle if you're able to do that as well, um, just because that can really inspire action in you when you are seeing the user on the other side of everything struggling to to use something. And they can really show you how they use a screen reader. You know, if you test manually yourself with a screen reader, you're not going to use it in the same way as somebody who's like really, really good at it. And apparently it turns out that people use screen readers very differently, um, you know, 
depending on who they are, which operating system they're on and things like that. So it can be super awesome to just talk to people um, rather than just trying to automate everything away, which I think doesn't always replace everything. Yeah, I think that's a great um, tip too, of like focusing on the experience of the product that you're building, not just, you know, the statistics and the static analysis. Um, A while back on Twitter, I posted a thread where I basically asked, you know, what uh, if you are somebody with a disability or who requires accessibility features on the web, what are some things that annoy you? And I got a lot of great feedback on that. And one of the things I tried for like a couple of hours, it wasn't that long, um, was to kind of try to, I don't know what the word would be, experience some of those issues myself. So one of the things I did was, for example, I somebody posted a message that said they had some sort of muscular disorder that prevented them from being able to move their hands across the keys of the keyboard um, at a wide distance. So it'd be like hard for them to go from a K to an A. Um, and so to test that out, one of the things I did is I put um, ankle weights on my wrists to like weigh my hands down and make it hard for me to move them. And then I just tried to like use the app that I was building at the time with my hands, like virtually immobile. And that was just something really interesting for me to experience. I also will try and like, um, for that time I put in like a sleeping mask over my eyes and then tried to browse the website I was building using a screen reader, um, and like a blindfold on essentially. Um, so yeah, I think there's like, if you really want to get into it, there's all sorts of like situations that you can put yourself into in order to test this out and experience it personally. In addition to, of course, the best way is always to go to the people who are experiencing those issues and hear them out and then um, use their feedback to improve your product. I love that so, so much. And it reminds me of the website. I don't know if you know about it, but it's called Empathy Prompts. And it's at empathyprompts.net. And every time you visit the page, it will give you a random scenario to try out exactly, exactly like what you just said about putting weights on your wrists. So every time you go to it, you get to um, kind of like have a random one to try out. And I think that it really does go back to empathy. Like you said, it's, it's putting yourself in the experience of another person. That's really awesome. Well, and even putting accessibility tools aside, just watching someone else use your website or your application is a deeply humbling experience. And it will often highlight to you things that you never would have thought of that are broken about that experience. Like we, the second you start building it, you have uh, embedded assumptions about the way that it's going to be used. And someone else coming in trying to use it has none of those assumptions. So like, I, I have not been a part of very many, uh, accessibility focused user tests, even without that additional layer of they're using this, using different tools, just it's a different person looking at this. Like it's mind boggling the number of different ways that people will try to use something. It's so true. That's a really good point. So what are some resources that you really like for people who want to read up a little bit more? We talked about tools, but, and we talked about the accessibility Slack, but does anybody have any favorite websites or favorite people that they like to follow for accessibility? I can start. (laughs) So my favorite people are Jen Luca, Leonie Watson, Marcy Sutton, Rob Dodson, and Cordelia Dillon. I have a lot more that I'm a fan of, but I'm trying to keep it concise. Uh, in, in particular, I wanted to call out Rob Dodson because he produces a series as part of the Chrome Developers YouTube channel called um, A11Y Cast or Alley Cast. And they're really nice bite sized videos um, for getting started with addressing things specifically for the web. And I really like how he approaches explaining things. And he has a lot of sort of visual examples also to show you exactly what he means. So I love that. Um, And another resource I really like is the Microsoft uh, Inclusive Toolkit. And that gives you some of those empathy prompts to consider, but also a, bu- a solid bunch of resources to go about that sort of mind shift around thinking in accessibility when you're designing things. I'm hastily jotting down notes because this is an area that you know I need a lot of work on. Uh, I, accessibility is not a strength 
for me. Um, when I was working on foundation, I'd always lean on a few different folks. Um, there's a young man from Germany named Marius Alberts or Olberts, but his, his moniker was Al- Alberts. So I always think of him that way. Um, and he did a bunch of keyboard nav and accessibility stuff. I was trying to see while you were talking, if he's done much writing on that. And I don't think so. So it's probably all buried down in GitHub issues. But he was one of my go-to people of like, I don't know how to solve this accessibility problem. I'm not even sure what it should be doing. Like, let me go and, and ping him. Safia, do you have some resources that you have as a go-to? So one of the things that I would recommend is the book Accessibility Handbook, um, Making 508 Compliant Websites by Katie Cunningham. Cunningham. Um, it is an O'Reilly book. I really like it. It's a good overview. So if you're like looking to get started and you kind of want a one-stop shop to go to, that's a good place to start. Um, provide some good code snippets for you as well. Um, and it's available on paperback. So I always think it's something you can take with you, read on the bus, read on the train, have at your bedside. Um, I find that when a book is physical, it's much easier to like digest the content um, as opposed to like a blog post or something like that. Um, So yeah, Accessibility Handbook, O'Reilly book by Katie Cunningham. You can buy it on Amazon and all of those other places. So yeah. I love book recommendations. That is one accessibility book I haven't read either, so I'm totally going to put that on my list. Another thing that I saw in your your notes that you put together was this the accessibility project. Um, I'm looking through. I like they've got you know it's a community driven thing, but one of the things I really appreciate is that they have an accessible pattern library and widget, and they you know you can see all of these things you know in code pen, well-documented, understanding what is it that they're doing from an accessibility standpoint. And they, they sort of indicate why, right? Like, so I'm looking at one and it's like, okay, we're going to set the tab index because otherwise this other thing, or in order to make this thing not able to receive focus while this is open. So it's kind of not just saying here's the attributes, but here's a real life example and why we're manipulating them this way. So that looks really cool. I'm actually going to dig through that a lot more. Yeah, I particularly love the Accessibility Project website because they're continually updating it as well. And I think that all of the content is maintained on GitHub. So if you want to add more to it, you can totally just open a pull request. And I've corrected even just some of their markdown typos that created display issues. Like I've even just done that at times. And they're really quick to respond. There are several people that maintain that site. So I always think it's a really good resource to mention. All right. Thanks everyone for sharing your resources. I know that I took down a few of these to look into later on, and uh, I'm hoping that those listening also have a nice bunch of resources that they can get started with. Thanks for listening to JS Party, and we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did producing it. We'll catch you next time. All right. Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. Read us an Apple podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. We'll be right back.